Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, we are going to focus, this particular session is going to focus about harm and repair in the anti-trafficking sector. We know that it's a sensitive topic, sensitive because none of us likes to be told that they've done something wrong and harm and repair is not easy work. It's quite uncomfortable. So first of all, I, we welcome you to be uncomfortable during this session. We welcome you to ask any questions and to also say what is coming up for you because we think we really think it's important that you do that. My name is Sophia Tende. Again, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the CEO of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery and I'll be joined with my colleague and co-author, Chris Ash. Hi, I'm Chris Ash. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the Survivor Leadership Program Manager for um, the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, where I manage the National Survivor Network. So, what do you mean by harm? <laughs> what do you mean by harm? is a question that I hear a lot. The reality is that uh, the way this space is designed, it's designed in such a way that a majority of the people, when I listen to their story about how they came to the work, is that they wanted to help. They listened to a story, they understood the issue, and they were moved to help. And sometimes when you talk about being moved to help, people, when people want to help and people are trying to help, it's very, very difficult to hear that the kind of help that you are giving either is not the help that is needed or, and, or you're helping and still harming people at the same time. And the reality is that in the space, the intention is not the intention is just as important like the impact of your actions are just as important as the intent and for the longest time we've only focused on the intent that all the people that want to work in this space have good intention they have good fundamentally good intentions and we don't discuss anything else but the impact of those intentions, the people that are impacted by these intentions are people with lived experiences, are marginalized communities and are communities that in many cases are not represented in the spaces where decisions are being made about the projects and the things that are, are need to happen and that needs to change. So we are saying the impact of your actions are just as important as the intent. And taking some time to think about it, to reflect, is just as important. And if any harm has been done, then it's important to think about repair. That's the purpose of this. Can so, I share a story, Sophie? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know that there was one time where I was supervising someone else who had lived experience. Obviously, I also have lived experience, but I was supervising someone and I was trying so hard to be encouraging along the way for the things that they were doing well that I wasn't doing as good of a job of clearly articulating where they needed to improve and clearly articulating that what they're doing wasn't meeting the expectations. And that ended up causing harm because the person was hearing the praise and wasn't realizing the weight of some of the things we needed to change. And after the fact, felt like I had not done a good job of telling them what they needed to improve. And that was coming from a place I just know sometimes it's helpful for people when we name ourselves that this has happened to us. It was coming from a place of wanting to be gentle, but the impact was just confusion and lack of clear communication, right? The reality, Chris, also is that the only reason you wanted to be that gentle was because there was someone with lived experience. Yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have applied the same uh, more you know, model of supervision if it was anybody else. Mm -hmm. So clearly also there's a bias. And that's the other thing is that the bias is the consistent treatment of survivors as beneficiaries means that you're mm -hmm. constantly helping. You're constantly helping and not seeing them as people with agency, as people with flaws, as people with power, as people able to make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah. I think that that's something that is good if there's other people who have lived experience on the call remembering that we swim in the same bias. Like we're not immune from bias just because we have lived experience either. And we're also not immune from causing harm. That's true. <laughs> no. So one of the things that um, is important in terms of harm, as many people are great at saying, yes, now we know and we need to think about, we need to, to, to move on, right? But the reality is that we haven't, we need to speak about how the sector in general has, has harmed historically has harmed people with lived experience historically. And these are just some of the ways and uh, between Chris and I, we will have uh, examples and stories maybe in some of the things so that we can be able to understand that the first one is gatekeeping. And gatekeeping has most, for me, has mostly been seeing the places where people choose to engage survivors and the places where we choose not to engage them. And the fact that there are spaces that are just, you know, you won't find people with lived experience in, uh, included, or the people just don't think that that needs to happen. And that mainly has been in strategic, for me, strategic planning and policy discussions are quite important because how people engage survivors, even in policy discussions, is not in the development of the policies, is in giving feedback to policies. Right. So uh, there's a lot. Um, I see a lot of giving feedback to policy. What I don't see is a lot of co-creation of that policy by uh, by people with lived experience. What I don't see is I don't see people asking what policies are needed, you know, so that that information of the policy that gets done is coming from people with lived experience funding mm -hmm. conversations right i uh how many how many how many donors you know include you know people with lived experience when they decide the kinds of funding that they want to give whether our funding is great or not mm -hmm. i think we see that too on the organizational side that organizations don't re don't engage people with lived experience to decide what kinds of funding to apply for Yes, it's that it's that they will an organization will decide they want to go for this funding without having a conversation with yeah. any of the people people with lived experience whether that project or that intervention makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's important to acknowledge that for gatekeeping, I'll say gatekeeping it's is also not just allies. Gatekeeping is also within the survivor you know, the people with lived experience and community mm -hmm. where we there are some, some spaces where we know that only certain, certain survivor leaders go to and no one else is invited and no one else, no one thinks about inviting anybody else but very, very specific survivors into this room. And I know I've been guilty of that because I'm one of the people who easily my name is recognizable as a person with lived experience so me getting into rooms is quite easy me getting into rooms is quite sometimes easy and people find it easy to bring me into rooms because they're familiar with me and get keeping can be me not wanting anybody else in those rooms but myself mm -hmm. and you see it Right, we see we 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 see that sometimes, and that needs to end, and that that sort of trickles into the next thing, which is tokenization, where essentially we are do we are using people with lived experience mainly just as a tick the box, and this is where most of it started. This is where I I have worked. We in the space and to see how organizations, well-meaning organizations, will, for example, have a conference. And then during the conference, the idea of meaningful inclusion is having a survivor panel. And that's it. Yes, that's it. <laughs> 
yes and it will be oh we have a we have a, a panel on on survivor on survivor leadership and the panel is all survivors mm -hmm. so yes we did meaningfully in, include mm -hmm. that's tokenization if survive if you don't have people with lived experience across <laughs> you know and we across it and this we see this happen we see this happen even in some of the advisory committees, the advisory boards, the board memberships, the hiring that we see, most of it is really lined up in a way that's tokenization. And we did, we, we say it's, this has, tokenization has really harmed this, a lot of survivor leaders. It's also just harmed how, if I was being honest, how survivor leaders show up at work because I've, I've, there are some cases where people has, have come to me and say, oh, we are struggling. We are struggling working with this person, despite the fact that we believe that they have the skills that they need. And it's mainly because most survivor leaders have been tokenized and don't even know how to show up in their professional skills. Mm -hmm. I would love to share. Um, I know similar to that, I saw an organization that was hiring for um, a professional consultants and they noticed that in the applications and the letters that all of the people, almost all of the people with lived experience led their letters, their cover letters by talking about all their trauma instead of, even when they had professional skills and it's because we're so used to that tokenization that it's hard to know how to show up. Yes, and it's quite it's quite sad to see it because it's what is rewarded, right? It is what is rewarded, and we can't also blame people for just wanting to survive because if being tokenized is what will pay your bills, is what will get you that consultancy, is what will get you ahead. Of course, you'll show up. You'll show up in five con conferences in a week retelling your stories or being shown around as a survivor because it makes sense mm -hmm. i know um so i'm just going to loop back to the gatekeeping when you were talking about getting people in the room i have a quote that i tell my the nsn members that i tell my children i tell anybody that'll listen to me about it like the quote is when the universe opens a door i take off the hinges and I think that that needs to be something that we need to think about. Those of us, I know you and I both do that. You and I both get into rooms and I know you and I are good at bringing other people into those rooms with us. And I would love to not just like figure out, let someone else figure out how to open the door, but how do we take off the hinges so that it's not an access issue? And I was, well, go ahead. Yeah, as we've, as we've said, we, we want a field. So we are taking out the door and breaking down the walls, right? <laughs> <laughs> Much to the chagrin of people who built those walls. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um. <clears throat> but that is important. We need to understand that there's enough room for all of us. Yeah. And yes, and if the doors and the walls is what will limit us being inclusive, I think we should take them down. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking too, when you talked about the panel, that often the people invited to have the panel um, are people who maybe are, they're not allowed to speak to the issues that are controversial. I'm trying to think of how to, how to ex give an example, but like if you're in a space that you have a community that's hostile to immigration, then you're probably not going, you know, a lot of times they avoid putting survivors who are themselves immigrants or have international trafficking experience on the panels that talk about immigration. They may put that one on the panel to talk about survivor leadership or about trauma, but they they tend to kind of like put people on the panels who are not as controversial. Similarly, if there's a survivor who like they may say at this conference, we're including survivors who have different perspectives on the sex trades, but we may put that survivor whose values around the sex trade are different from our own on the panel that talks about childhood trauma, but not on the panel that talks about sex work. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Or there's that token. Yes. That's, that's, def that, that's definitely, definitely so that we can say, yes, we had survivors speak on this 
but it's not the survivors representing that issue or the ones that would say. So I've been called many times to like have a conversation, for example, on sex trafficking. And I always say, no, I, I, that's not my experience. So I, I don't have, if, if you, any, any opinion I have on sex trafficking is academic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really, really academic. That's the truth. I don't have lived experience of sex trafficking. So don't call me for, uh, to, to sit on your panel for sex trafficking as someone with lived experience. You can call me to sit on that panel as a practitioner. I mean, it's fine because I'm one, but you wouldn't have included survivors on that panel if you have me, right? And that's what people don't think about. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is vilification. And this, we, we, we see it all the time where some people are seen as being difficult. Some people are seen as being, you know, not, pop. I, I, I've always spoken about like the myth of the perfect survivor and 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 that's it. That we do have perfect survivors. We do have those that show up in a particular way, and everyone is happy to have them. And then the rest that complain or ask questions or want things to change, vilified, right? And that has been used a lot, especially to pit survivor leaders against each other in the space where one person is seen as being perfect and another voice is seen as being not perfect and their experience not being valid. And in most cases, it's just the lack of really employing an intersectional, you know, uh, lens when we are thinking about this work. And as we've said before, just being a survivor then and vilification comes as a result of tokenization, actually, is that if someone, the reason why we tokenize people is because they represent the aspects we want, we want from survival leaders the aspect, and not any other thing. So that if some, somebody else shows up with any aspect that we don't want, they are vilified for showing up in that way. And that is also something that needs to change. And we see it, we see xenophobia, we see racism. Like this space is not devoid of that. We see homophobia, it's not. Like most of the most of the time, the perfect survivor doesn't look like Chris and I, <laughs> most of the time. And, and most of the time, the, the, the perfect survivor is someone that is fragile, is someone that doesn't have agency, is someone, and anything else then is vilified. And yeah, I, I, I really truly hope that we can be able to acknowledge what we historically done wrong and think about how do we change? How do we move from, from, mm -hmm. from this? I think, can I throw it one more layer of vilification in? Not only are yes. we vilified, but I think sometimes trafficking gets used as a as a concept or a tool for vilifying populations and othering people. Like I think about that as someone I identify as non-binary. And um that's under for me, I think of that as under the trans umbrella. And sometimes I see fears of trafficking getting stoked to to strengthen anti-trans sentiment. You know what I'm saying? When they start calling um, LGBTQ people groomers and trying to reframe things, or when you see like fears of trafficking used to increase policing in Black communities in the U.S. You know what I mean? Like, do you see, do you see that on the global stage as much where trafficking gets thrown in to go after someone you don't want to? Yes, 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 definitely. Especially with the policing, right? is that as soon as as soon as you talk about protecting children as soon as you talk about things like grooming of course everyone is going to want to 
act in, to act in a particular way so that they can be able to they, they can be able to protect people they deem worthy of being saved right so yes totally agree on whole communities being vilified as a, in the in the name of trafficking because everyone agrees that trafficking is a hundred percent wrong a hundred percent horrible so any any anyone who is seen in any way as doing it is seen as you know some somebody not worth living so there's also okay. that yeah, we saw that in the U.S. a while back when fears of trafficking were used to build build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border and all of a sudden fears of trafficking are being used to justify um, anti-immigrant sentiment as if anti-immigrant sentiment isn't a vulnerability to risk to trafficking itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's surreal. Um, yeah, so... Me and um, Cassandra Ng and Ethan Levine, who is at CAST as our research specialist, did some interviews um, a couple of years ago with survivors, and we noticed some themes, and we ended up presenting on some of these basic themes last year at the Conference for the Association for Applied Sociology. Um, and we looked at these emerging themes that everybody described similar kinds of harm. So what kinds of harm do survivors experience? Um, Identity-based and intersectional oppression, which is what Sophie was just talking about with the vilification. We see conflicts around the sex trades that are not moderated or um, you know, where some people are given permission and empowered to um, bully and harass other people around conflicts in the sex trades rather than having to come up with a, a collaborative solution together. We see labor exploitation. I'm always appalled at the number of survivors who work in anti-trafficking orgs that are not being paid properly. Um, I've seen situations where people are being asked to review documents or share their story without compensation or like Sophie has mentioned in our other presentation with low compensation, inadequate compensation. Um, we've also seen situations where people will report back that money's tight in the org where they're working. And so they're working, they're only getting paid for about 20% of their hours because funding got cut. And that's appalling to me. Um, the gatekeeping, which we talked about earlier, Sophie explained a lot about. So when we think about how we can address these harms, what we landed on was thinking about reframing survivor leadership. So we need to completely rethink what we think of as survivor leadership. Um, I know Sophie and I talk about that in our meaningful engagement of people with lived experience presentation, that if we keep thinking about survivor leadership the way we always have, where you can either be a peer support specialist in which you tell your story to other people to inspire them, a policy person in which you tell your story to make the legislators cry and pass certain laws, or a fundraising storyteller in which you share your story to raise money. If that's all we're thinking of as survivor leadership, these harms are gonna keep happening. We also need to address root causes, which means that if identity-based and intersectional oppression is, is a form of harm and is leading people to be more vulnerable to trafficking, then anti-racism work is itself anti-trafficking work because we're addressing the root cause. Anti-homophobia, anti-transphobia, initiatives to ensure the safety and protection of LGBTQ people, including LGBTQ youth, that's addressing a root cause. That's reducing vulnerability to trafficking. Thinking about safe migration routes and letting people come in as refugees or asylum seekers without treating them as criminals that's addressing the root cause. And then the power sharing, which we talk a lot about in the meaningful engagement of people with lived experience session. Power sharing is addressing those harms because that's kind of offsetting that gatekeeping, right? That's offsetting that labor exploitation. We took some of the themes that we saw in these interviews and um, two things happened that kind of built on it. One of them, the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Policy and Evidence Center did a global research study on engagement of lived experience in international policy and programming. And um, the NSNI was involved in the, um, the study in the US where we looked at what people in the US were experiencing and what they thought was meaningful engagement. And while that focused on meaningful engagement, 
a lot of people in the interview spoke about different kinds of harms they had experienced. We also then convened a lived and professional experience working group on harms, which Sophie and I were both part of. That is where we had a good number of, of people who have lived experience who are also working in this field. And not just I work in the field as a consultant, but I mentor other survivor leaders, right? People who are really in touch with what survivors are experiencing. We went through and reviewed the themes from the NSN interviews. We reviewed the themes from this PEC report. And then we read the 2022 TIP report. <laughs> excuse me, which Sophie was highlighted in um, as an example of what meaningful engagement looks like, because that TIP report had a strong focus on meaningful engagement. We spent some time in that working group really building trust and norming and did some, some recommendations. We made recommendations to address it. You can find that work on the NSN's website at nationalsurvivornetwork.org slash harm and repair. And that gives you some access to our, um, our work on harm and repair that came out of that lived and professional experience working group. So here's one that this came up in our conversations in, about harm and repair in that working group. One of the, the thing that really blew my mind was we think how we work with survivors as clients or beneficiaries and how we engage survivors as leaders are two separate issues, but they're not. <laughs> they're the same because we have, people have, and obviously we all internalize them too and have to work to unpack them, but we have biases, beliefs, and assumptions about people with lived experience of trafficking and their needs. Some of those biases that I see show up in my in the work that I do that I see throughout the sector are they're not capable of making their own decisions. Um, they need someone to tell them what to do. Um, they can make small steps towards healing, but they can't really be like other people. All of they these can never they can never heal. They, they can, can never heal. The consistent one is they can never heal. So we need to consistently take care of them forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Yeah. So that shows up in the way we do our programs and policies, right? We write policies for people who can never heal. We write policies to try to protect people who don't know how to make their own decisions. And that includes legislative policies, but also policies in our organizations. We design programs for people that we don't believe will ever be able to fully heal. We design programs for people who don't know how to make their own decisions. And that ends up leading to harm to our participants, clients, and to the communities they come from. Those same biases, that gets embedded in survivor leadership models and sector leadership norms. Those people can never heal, so we can't give them, uh, we can't trust them to honor a confidentiality agreement. They can never heal, so we're just going to be okay with it if they scream and yell and misbehave and like treat people poorly because it's their trauma. Um, if they're treating other survivors poorly, um, that's just how they do, right? Um, we also have, they don't know how to make decisions. Therefore, they should not be in decision-making roles. We can't really trust them to be in decision-making roles. This leads to harm to survivor leaders and other survivors working in the sector. And the, the thing that really stood out to me in our lived in a professional experience working group is there's a gap that causes harm. We have survivors in these programs where they aren't really empowered and expected to fully heal and, and given opportunities to make their own decisions and chart their own course where we're just in supporting roles, right? We should be in supporting roles for that person doing their own healing. And then they graduate from services and we expect them to jump into being leaders, what have we done to invest in them between crisis services and leadership? What is the economic development we've provided them so that they're not having to still, in survivor leadership, make choices based on crisis income and do things they don't wanna. Those people telling their stories that Sophie mentioned at five conferences in a week, they often don't wanna be. But that's what's paying their bills because we haven't we haven't invested in them economically. Um, we haven't changed the structures that they're living under. And suddenly we expect them to come in and be leaders when we haven't supported them beyond the crisis mode. 
almost like I got you out of trafficking. You're welcome. Now go be poor like everyone else. <laughs> right? So how are we investing in people? And this one requires long-term investment. And I know Sophie can speak some to what that looks like. Yes, it, 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 this requires long-term investment and not just long-term investment in programs. It requires long-term investment in communities. The reality is that the only way we can do long-term investment is that if, if that investment is made in communities that actually host, you know, and stay with these people, as people that see them every day, the communities that hold them when their parent dies, the community that holds them when they when they have a baby, like that. That's why we need to put the investment, right? Our programs at the moment don't think about communities. Our programs are about interventions, right? Very specific interventions with very specific measurable outcomes that we've foreseen. So. If we are to do a long-term investment as donors, we need to completely change the way we fund. We cannot continue to fund interventions mm -hmm. because the, those <clears throat> interventions are the, have, only have the ability to provide emergency care. And it's emergency care that is measured. If you're looking at how many, the number, what, the, what we call impact, right? number of people who are liberated, a number of people who are rescued, number of people who went to or went to school, right? We don't question, we are not measuring number of people who stayed in school, number mm -hmm. of people who that education led to employment. Those are not the questions we are asking, right? It's number of people we paid school fees for. We are not questioning the quality of edu education, right? So we also have to change the way we measure impact. Mm -hmm. If uh, we, we have to change the way we measure impact because we can't continue to measure impact the way that we do. That we do. And the way we think about, we also have to change the way we think about care, right? We have to change the way we, what we prioritize, right? Because we prioritize, and I'm not saying these things are not needed. Many of us have said that most of the work that is being done right now is like going out and then having that, a car accident has happened and an ambulance comes and it picks the people who've been in the car accident and you, they take them to the accident and the accident and emergency place and they're stabilized and you know what after they're stabilized the hospital says okay it's time for you to go home you are now ready to go and tell and talk to everyone about how you can survive accidents the reality <laughs> the reality is that most of what we've prioritized as care is accident and emergency we we are not we are we are not pro providing holistic <clears throat> um, care because frankly first of all it is expensive yeah Two, i'm saying this as a donor it is unpredictable in some cases it is hard to measure mm -hmm. and sometimes the success doesn't look as appealing as saying we have rescued a thousand people Mm -hmm. and we have we have to hold that tension and be uncomfortable with it because it's just the truth mm -hmm. but it is what 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 we have to think when we think about care is what care do survivors need and we find that out by listening to them not by making assumptions about what we would want yes and i <clears throat> as someone who was in direct service for a long time, I realized that we've designed a system that consistently brings survivors to our accident and emergency room consistently, right? Because if you, we haven't made a diagnosis of what really is the issue, they will be back consistently. Yeah. And, and, and that's just the way the system is designed. 
that kind of gets me into thinking about what it looks like in practice, what you were just sharing. You shared as a donor and as someone who's done direct service. We do a good job at, at, or at least we try to do a good job at crisis management. We put a lot of resources into crisis management, but not into long-term investment. And so when we think about that, the funding goes to things like shelters, residential programs, emergency health care. These are all really important, but then it's kind of like, well, now we can't help you anymore. Come back if you have another crisis, right? And this is why we see rates of people. We see people being re-exploited. They, they get exploited. They get trafficked. They find their way out. They get some basic services. And then when they're trafficked again, I've actually heard service providers and experts on trafficking say, oh, they just weren't ready for their healing. That's why they got re-trafficked. And that's appalling to me, right? It's because we just focus on crises. So if you're with a local program or domestic or a direct service provider, what I'd recommend when you think about all of this harm, don't just get all buried under it and think, well, then we shouldn't do anything ever. Um, recommendations are acknowledge harm and accept responsibility. Um, an organization I've seen do this fairly well is Love 146. Um, they have a founder's story where in their video now, the founder says, I got invited to go on um, on this raid overseas to try to help stop children who were being trafficked. And I didn't know at the time that that wasn't my place. I love that this person says that. They stopped using the language of modern day slavery because they work in the U.S. where a lot of times the language of slavery gets weaponized in weird ways about trafficking. When they stopped using that language in their promotions and their literature, they made a blog post about why and acknowledged that they'd ha caused harm. I think there can be a tendency to want to just change what you're doing and hope nobody notices that you ever did it differently. But we remember. <laughs> we remember hearing what you did and seeing what you did. So acknowledge it and say, I didn't know better. I'm working on doing better now. Listen to feedback that you're getting. Take it seriously. Um, I would say invest in grassroots organizations. I know Sophie was talking earlier uh, about how we we need to have people who already have trust in the communities doing some of this work. And so how do we invest in those programs rather than say, we don't know this community. What do we need to learn to go into the community and do this work? Sometimes it's easier and more authentic to say, who's already in that community doing this work? And how can we support them? They already know what they're doing. Yeah, and and that's the thing, even when you think about how funding is designed, especially when you think about like a call for a call for proposal for very, very specific interventions, right? And if you go into those communities most of the time, you'll find people doing the work. How can we fund the work that is already ongoing without interference? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Because some the way we've designed funding at the moment is we've designed it in such a way that communities have to reorganize how they provide support and care to fit the interventions that we want. Mm -hmm. As yeah. yeah. I think about how they're often... I, I, to use invisibilize as a verb, they, they're often invisibilized because they're like, there's nobody doing work in that region. Well, maybe the answer is there's nobody doing work in that region or that community that's doing work that looks like your work because that community needs something different, right? It's got big colonial vibes, you know? <laughs> we don't see that they have structures and systems for supporting each other because we choose not to see them because we're expecting it to look a certain way. Um. I would say if you're with a local program, think of sustainable solutions, that investment we were talking about. And I don't just mean investment of money in terms of funding, but I'm thinking about investment in the people. Like what are you providing them once they graduate case management that's going to help invest in their ability to move into whatever kind of leadership they want, whether it's in the movement or not? How do we engage communities authentically, really build those partnerships with other um, or other organizations that are already part of these communities? How do we center survivors in everything we do and increase our levels of meaningful survivor engagement? So if you and I have a toolkit and a whole workshop that we've done for this conference on meaningful engagement of people with lived experience that has a lot of guidance on how to do that in a concrete way. 
I know before we move into our discussion, I wanted to share these three resources that informed our presentation and our lens today. Um, and here are QR codes that can take you to each of these. So we have the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Review of Current Promising Practices in Meaningful Engagement that does talk about meaningful engagement, but addresses some of the harm that happens. We have this toolkit that Sophie and I developed in collaboration with our teams um, on meaningful engagement of people with lived experience that has assessments and surveys to help organizations actually track where they are on these different levels of engagement. And then we have the We Name It So We Can Repair It report that includes strong recommendations, explanations of how harm happens, and a lot of good information in there about what we mean by accountability and repair. So these are three great resources uh, that we would love to invite you to explore if you were engaged by some of what we spoke about today. So looking at leadership as decision-making, it requires continual investment. We know that there's crisis in case management. We know that we expect survivors to be survivor leaders, but we don't really have what's in this gap. I think that's what we would love to focus our Q&A and discussion on today is these questions, imagining what could we put in that gap that would, um, would, would help the service, help build services between crisis and case management and survivor leadership. Think about who's funding this kind of work, this middle gap work. Where do we get funds when so many of our funds are focused on crisis and case management? and some funds on survivor leadership, who's funding that work in the gap? Are there- And what does that, yeah. what that work look like, right? Yeah. What, what, does that that, what, does, what does that work look like? Do you know anybody who's doing that work? Yeah. Yeah. Who's already doing it? How can we partner with them to benefit um, the people that we're working with? So these are the things we want to talk about when we go into Q&A into our group discussion. Let's start by just answering for together now. Let's let's brainstorm. Let's envision what some of this work looks like. What is in that gap? How do we make that gap a reality? How do we fill it and make some some of these programs a reality? Yes. 